Hello students. In this presentation, I will be covering the concepts presented in chapter one, Biology, the Science of Life, and the Essentials of Biology Textbook, sixth edition. To start off with, each chapter is divided into various sections, and the presentations I make are also divided into these sections. Each section will be headed with the section number and title that should match what you see in the textbook. In this case, we are going to start with section 1.1, which covers the characteristics of life. Now for each section, I will also highlight the learning outcomes. These outcomes are important because I base my study guides and exams off of them, and they are a great way to help you make note of what you need, what you need to be learning and understanding for each section. Now, upon completing this section, you should be able to explain the basic characteristics common to all living organisms, distinguish between the levels of biological organization, summarize how the terms homeostasis, metabolism, and adaptation relate to all living organisms, and contrast chemical cycling and energy flow within an ecosystem. So first, let us introduce the concepts of life. So one thing you may have observed during your long existence on Earth is that Earth is covered with life. And the life that exists here on this tiny rock is incredibly diverse. So let's look at some examples. So here we have um, the tiny single-celled organisms such as bacteria. We also have complex multicellular organisms, such as people and other animals. We also have plants, such as the sunflower. And then we also have organisms called fungi, such as this mu mushroom. Now, all of these are examples of life and all of its diversity. And while these examples seem vastly different from each other, they do share commonality in their organization as well as specific characteristics that separate a living organism from its non-living surroundings. Now, biology is the scientific discipline that studies all things that are living, and it is the biologist that studies life's diversity and what it means to be a living thing. So that begs the question, what exactly makes something alive? Well, in terms of science, you are alive if you have all of these characteristics. So to be alive, you must have levels of organization. You must be able to acquire materials and energy. You must be able to maintain an internal environment. You must be able to respond to stimuli. You must also be able to reproduce and develop. And then finally, you must also have the ability to adapt and evolve to changing conditions. So in the eyes of science, again, you are not considered to be a living thing if you do not meet all of these criteria. So to be alive, you must be capable of all of these things here that are listed. <clears throat> Okay, so let us begin our exploration of these characteristics of life by diving into what it means to be, have, what it means to have levels of biological organization. <clears throat> okay, so life is complex, but highly organized. We biologists have made sense of this complexity by studying life at different stages of organization of inclusion where each level is nested within the next stage, okay? So this particular table that I'm getting ready to walk you through is going to start with the most complex and most inclusive stage, and then it will follow down to the least complex and least inclusive stage. So the most complex and inclusive level of organization is the biosphere. Now the biosphere includes all regions on the Earth's crust, its waters and atmosphere that include living things, okay? So in this particular example, uh, the biosphere includes all surfaces on Earth, 
again, that include land, water, and atmosphere that are inhabited by living things, okay? Now, the next level of organization is going to be the ecosystem. And ecosystems are regions within the biosphere that include all living things plus the physical non-living environment that the living things interact with. So in our example here, we have zoomed into the ecosystem of the African savanna. Okay, so in this picture, we do see both elements that are living and elements that are non-living. So our living elements are going to include our trees and grasses. We also have some animal life here, such as our zebras, as well as this tribe of people. Okay, now our non-living elements that are present in this ecosystem are going to be the source of water over here. We also have a building, uh, a structure that the tribe uses to live in. And then we also have these mountains in the background that are considered to be the non-living elements in this ecosystem. Okay. Now, the next level down is going to be the community. And community only includes all the living components of an ecosystem, as well as their interactions between other living components, okay? So continuing on our example, we are now only focusing our attention on everything that is living. So we have grasses, we have a tree, we have our tribe of people, and we have our zebra. And anything that is studied at the community level is going to be looking at how the zebra interacts with the grasses or how the people interact with the zebra. So it's different species interacting together in a similar area, okay? <clears throat> okay, so the next level of organization is going to be the population, okay? And a population is the level that includes organisms of the same species that are located in a particular area, okay? So continuing on our example, uh, the populations that we're going to be focusing on are going to be our people and some of these trees, okay? So you have a population of people in a given area, and you have a population of trees in a given area, okay? Now, next is the species level, okay? And species includes organisms in a population that are interacting and interbreeding with each other, okay? So this is an important distinction because some individuals in the same population may be too far apart to regularly interact with each other, okay? So this just includes individuals that are actively exchanging um, genetic information, they are actively breeding with each other, okay? So in our example, we're going to focus on a small group of people as our species and, our, and then a small group of trees as well, okay? Okay, so continuing our discussion of levels of biological organization, the next step is going to be the individual organism, okay? So this level of organization only includes the individual and the complexities contained within a single individual, okay? So our example here is gonna be a single human, and then we also are going to look at a single tree, okay? So that is the individual. <clears throat> All right, so the next level of organization is within the individual, and that is the organ systems. So organ systems are composed of several different organs that work together to keep an individual alive, okay? So in our example, uh, we are going to be looking at the nervous system as our organ system in, the, in a person, and then in the tree, uh, we are going to focus in on the shoot system, okay? So that includes leaves and branches. Right. Okay, so next is the organ, and an organ is composed of tissues functioning together to perform a specific task. Okay, so in our human, the brain is one of the organs that is associated with the nervous system. Okay, and then in the plant, the leaves are an organ associated with the shoot system. Okay, so we've just gone down another level of organization. Okay, and then the next level of organization is going to be our tissues. And a tissue contains groups of cells that have commonalities in structure and function, okay? So uh, the tissue that is located in the brain is gonna be nervous tissue, all right? And tissues that are located in leaves are going to be leaf tissue, okay? All right, next is the cell. The cell is considered to be the structural and functional unit of all living organisms. That is because the cell is the smallest unit that still exhibits and shares all six characteristics of life. Okay, so again, 
to be considered alive in the eyes of science, you must have all of those characteristics that we listed earlier. And the cell is the smallest unit that can still do that. Okay. All right, so in our example, we're gonna focus in on a nerve cell. All right, and then in our tree example, we're going to look at a plant cell. So these are individual cells that make up a tissue, and that tissue makes up a leaf, and the leaf makes up the organ system, and so on. Okay. Now the next level down is going to be the molecule. Molecules are simply the combination of two or more atoms of the same or different elements. Okay. Molecules are not considered to be living things by themselves, but they do make up living things, okay? So for example, we have many, many biological molecules inside of our bodies, such as proteins, sugars, uh, lipids, etc. okay? And then finally, the smallest, least complex, and least inclusive level of organization is the atom. Atoms are the smallest unit of an element and are composed of subatomic particles such as electrons, protons, and neutrons. And we will look much more closely at atoms next week in chapter two. All right, so let us continue. Okay, so the next characteristic that we're gonna take a look at is that life requires materials and energy. All right. So all life from single cells to complex organisms are not capable of maintaining organization or carrying out the necessary activities without some sort of outside energy and outside material, okay? So many organisms like this sea otter pictured here need to eat and food provides nutrient molecules which are used as building blocks to make needed molecules within the body as well as provide a source of energy, okay? So energy is the capacity to do work and it takes a lot of work to maintain the organization of the cell and the organism. So when cells use nutrient molecules to make parts of themselves, they carry out a sequence of chemical reactions, okay? So your metabolism is simply a term that is used to encompass all of the chemical reactions that take place inside of your body. Now, the ultimate source of energy for all life on Earth is going to be the sun. So plants and other types of organisms are capable of capturing solar energy and carrying out photosynthesis. So photosynthesis itself is a series of chemical reactions that can transform that solar energy from the sun into chemical energy embedded in nutrient molecules that all living organisms can access and use, okay? So any organism that can undergo the process of photosynthesis are collectively called producers, okay? And then animals and other organisms that get their energy from the nutrient molecules ultimately made by producers are called consumers, okay? <clears throat> All right, so the energy and chemical flow between organisms also defines how an ecosystem functions, okay? So within an ecosystem, you're gonna have chemical cycling and energy flow, and those are gonna begin with producers, such as grasses, which take solar energy and inorganic nutrients to produce food by photosynthesis, okay? Now, <clears throat> chemical cycling is depicted in these blue arrows here in this image. Um, occurs as chemicals move from one population to another in a food chain until death and decomposition allow the inorganic nutrients to be returned to the producers once again, okay? So here we have um, our producers, okay, which is gonna be these grasses, all right? And those producers are going to get eaten, say, by the rabbit, okay? And then the rabbit is going to get eaten by the hawk. And then eventually that hawk will also die. And when the hawk dies, it will presumably die somewhere on the ground, and then its body will be decomposed, and all of the nutrients and chemicals that, that made up both the rabbit and the hawk will be recycled using decomposers down here, such as fungi, 
and other types of mushrooms. All right. And so these chemicals are constantly cycled in a circle um, and reused and repeated over and over and over again. Okay. Now, energy, which is depicted as the red arrows here, on the other hand, uh, flows from the sun through the plants and to other members of the food chain as they feed on one another. Now, the energy will gradually uh, disapparate and return to the atmosphere as heat. So that is what is being depicted here. Okay. <clears throat> Thus, energy flows in a linear fashion in one direction and cannot be recycled. So energy is always going to flow from the sun to the producers, to the consumers, um, to the decomposers, and disapparate out as heat, not to be recycled. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, because energy does not cycle, ecosystems cannot stay in existence without the constant reintroduction of energy back into the ecosystem through photosynthesis conducted by producers. Okay? So that is why we absolutely need the sun to survive because the sun is constantly reintroducing energy back into ecosystems and we use that e energy to uh, carry out um, living activities, okay? All right. <clears throat> Okie okay, dokie. Okay. So let us talk a little bit about uh, the ability for life to maintain an internal environment. Okay. So for metabolic processes to continue, living organisms need to keep themselves stable with regards to temperature, moisture levels, acidity, and other factors critical to staying alive. So many metabolic activities conducted within organisms are involved in maintaining homeostasis. Okay? So homeostasis is a fancy word we use to describe an internal environment that stays within a set of physiological boundaries. Okay? So for example, a chili lizard may raise its internal body temperature by basking in the sun on a hot rock and when that lizard starts to overheat, it will simply scurry back into the shade to cool down. Another example is when you are studying and forget to eat lunch, your liver will release stored sugar to keep your blood sugar levels within a certain range. Okay? And many organ systems in our bodies are actually involved in some way in maintaining this internal environment, the state of homeostasis. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how um, life responds to external stimuli. So in order to find enough food and energy to stay alive, organisms must interact with their surroundings. So the ability to respond often results in some type of movement. So you have Single-celled organisms, such as bacteria, uh, will beat hairs on the surface of the cell to move away from uh, excess light or chemicals. Okay. Another example is the monarch butterfly. Monarch butterflies can sense the approach of fall and begin to migrate south to find places where resources are more plentiful. Okay. Um, another example would be a vulture smelling meat from a mile away and thus soaring closer towards its dinner. Okay, so appropriate responses such as these examples help ensure the survival of the organism and allow it to carry out its daily activities. Altogether, we typically call these types of activities behavior. And there are many biologists that study just the behavior of organisms such as myself, okay? All right, so let's talk a bit, a little bit about the ability for life to reproduce and develop. <clears throat> so life begets life. So everything that is alive must have the ability to reproduce or make another organism like itself. So for example, bacteria and other types of single-celled organisms simply split themselves into two. While multicellular organisms, on the other hand, um, have a reproductive process that usually begins with the pairing of a sperm from one individual and an egg from another individual. Now, this union of sperm and egg is followed by many cell divisions, which results in the formation of an embryo. 
that embryo um, will eventually be born and become an immature adult, uh, or excuse me, immature individual, which will then grow and develop into various stages, eventually becoming an adult capable of reproduction. Now, an embryo develops into a well or a sunflower or a human based off of a specific set of genes inherited from the parents. Now, genes are basically sets of instructions contained in a long molecule of DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid. Now, DNA is considered to be the blueprint of all life and as it is the molecule that contains those genes, those instructions. Now, we will get into DNA and genetics uh, a little bit more in depth as we get along in the semester, but this is just a quick introduction. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now, the last characteristic that I want to touch on is going to be um, the ability for life to change and adapt. Okay. So, adaptations are modifications that make species more suited to their way of life. For example, hawks can fly due to how their body is constructed. They have hollow bones to reduce their weight and flight muscles in their arms to help compress and elevate the wings during flight. There are many different species of hawk where some have feet with claws modified to better catch fish, while others have feet better modified to catch rabbits. Now, humans also have adaptations that allow them to live in specific environments. For example, humans who live at extreme elevations in the Himalayas, uh, where there is less oxygen in the air, have an adaptation that reduces the amount of hemoglobin produced in the blood. Okay, So hemoglobin is an important molecule for the transport of oxygen. Normally, as our body moves up in elevation, the amount of hemoglobin in our blood increases as well to accommodate lower amounts of oxygen. However, too much hemoglobin can make your blood too thick and unable to work properly. Thus, people in some high elevation populations have this adaptation of lower hemoglobin levels to make their lives better suited to living in that particular environment. Okay, so that concludes section 1.1. So let's go ahead and dive into section 1.2, evolution, the core concept of biology. Now, upon completion of this section, you should be able to define the term evolution, explain the process of natural selection and its relationship to evolutionary processes, and summarize the general characteristics of the domains and major kingdoms of life. <clears throat> All right, to start off this section, let us first define what evolution is. So evolution describes a process by which populations change over time often with adaptations to their environment, and then pass on these changes to the next generation. Now, evolution defines how life changes, but it never concludes or suggests even how life began. So what we can confirm from the process of evolution is that all life shares a common ancestor. The six characteristics of life that we just discussed in the previous section provide evidence to this idea of common ancestry. So we biologists use evolutionary trees to help map out our current understanding of evolutionary relationships among organisms, which can be traced back to that common ancestor. So as you can see here, the base of the tree represents the common ancestor of all organisms depicted in the tree. Okay, So organisms grouped on the same branch, such as this fungi and animals, are more closely related to one another, meaning they have a more recent common ancestor than organisms on different branches, such as animals and plants, for example. 
So each of these branch points here represents an ancestor. And as we move up the particular tree, we have more and more recent common ancestors. Okay. <clears throat> so organisms, again, that have few branch points between their placement and the base of the tree, such as bacteria, means that there were fewer changes along their evolutionary line and they more closely resemble or are more closely related to the original common ancestor. Okay, So uh, compared to a any animal, for example, bacteria are much more closely related to the original common ancestor um, than our animals, which have many, many uh, branch points and many, many more recent common ancestors farther down the line. Okay, so that's the basics of how to interpret evolutionary trees. All right. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about natural selection and evolutionary processes. But first, let's look at a little bit of history. So in the 19th century, two naturalists, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace, came independently to the conclusion that evolution occurs by means of a process called natural selection. Darwin is the most famous of the two because he wrote the book on the origin of species, which presented his observations on how the process of evolution works using natural selection. Since that time, evolution has become a core concept of biology, not only because the theory explains so many different uh, scientific observations, but the wealth of data collected since Darwin's time uh, provide the support to the theory and its importance in all aspects of biological sciences. Okay. <clears throat> so what exactly is natural selection? Well, the process of natural selection is the mechanism by which evolutionary change occurs. It is based on how a population changes in response to its environment. Okay. So environments may change due to the influence of living factors, such as a new predator, or non-living factors, such as differences in temperature or precipitation. So as the environment changes over time, some individuals of a species may possess certain adaptations that make them better suited to the new environment. Those individuals with those adaptations tend to live longer and have more opportunities to reproduce, thus passing those favorable traits to the next generation. So this difference in reproductive success is called natural selection, and that results in changes in the characteristics of a population over time. And the change in the frequency of these traits in a population over time is what we call evolution, okay? So the phrase common descent with modification sums up the process of evolution because it means that as descent occurs from the common ancestor, modifications occur that cause the organism to be adapted to a particular environment, okay? Thus, specific adaptations allow species to play particular roles in their environment. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at an evolution example. So the Hawaiian honey creepers are a remarkable example of the process of natural selection. The more than 50 known species of honey creepers, uh, currently there are only 17 left, all evolved from one species of finch, which likely originated in North America and arrived to the islands between three to five million years ago. Okay, so modern honey creepers have an assortment of bill shapes that are adapted to different types of food. Okay, so some have elongated bills used for drinking flower nectar, others have strong hooked beaks. Okay, suited for digging into tree bark and seizing wood boring insects, and then others have very small <clears throat> um, bills uh, that are meant for feeding on seeds and fruits. Okay, so even with such dramatic differences in feeding, 
um, and bill shape, honey creepers still share certain characteristics, um, which stem from their original common finch ancestor. Okay, so the various honey creeper species are still very similar in their body shape and size, and they all have very similar mating and nesting behaviors. Okay. <clears throat> All right, Ian. What is it, Cheyenne? Okay, I'm trying to record. All right, so let us continue. All right, so let's look at um, how we biologists tend to organize the diversity of life. So because life is so diverse, it is helpful to have a system that groups of organisms um, are placed into categories. So there are two areas of biology that help us group organisms into categories. The first is going to be taxonomy. And taxonomy is the discipline of naming and classifying organisms according to certain rules. And then systematics is um, a discipline that classifies organisms according to presumed evolutionary relationships. Um, so, systematists learn about evolutionary relationships between species, um, some tax, uh, taxonomy and taxonomic groups of given organisms may change. So, uh, systematists are even now making observations and performing experiments that will one day bring change in the classification system adapted by the textbook we are using. So perhaps uh, five years from now, the classification of organisms may have been rearranged several times, but it is all in an effort to reflect the truest relationships among organisms given the available knowledge, okay? So um, currently uh, we tend to use this particular system of classification where we have, again, a higher, more inclusive uh, group trickling down to a least inclusive group. So these categories, um, starting with the most inclusive is going to be the domain, followed by the kingdom, followed by the phylum, then class, then order, then family, then genus, and then species. So again, these categories of classification help us organize uh, organisms into these various groups of most inclusive to least inclusive. So let's look at an example over here. So um, this example is how humans are classified. Okay. So the domain is the most inclusive group. So there are many different types of organisms inside this domain. And for us as people, we are in the domain at Eukarya. Okay. And then within the domain Eukarya, we are classified under the kingdom Animalia. And then within the kingdom Animalia, we are classified under the phylum Chordata. And then within the phylum Chordata, we are classified in the class Mammalia. And then within the class Mammalia, we are in the order of primates. And then within the order of primates, we are in the, the family um, Hominidae. Hominidae. And then within the family hominididae, we are in the genus Homo. And then finally, we can get super specific to just referring to people. And we are the species sapiens or Homo sapiens. Okay. So that's how these categories work. They get more highly inclusive to least inclusive as we move down into each level of classification. <clears throat> All right. So let us talk a little bit about the three domains. So the, the domains, again, are the most inclusive and most general classification in this system that we biologists have made. So there are three domains that all life is separated into, okay? So the first is going to be domain archaea. And in domain archaea, you're going to have organisms that are prokaryotes. So prokaryotes are simply organisms that are unicellular, and they lack a lot of organization and specificity inside their cell. Okay, so they lack what we call membrane-bound organelles. Now, it is believed currently that um, archaea may have been 
some of the first cells to exist on Earth. Okay. So the next of the three domains that all organisms are classified within is the domain bacterium. And domain bacteria is also a domain that contains nothing but prokaryotes. And again, prokaryotes are uh, simple unicellular organisms, and they don't have a lot of complexity inside their cell. So they, again, lack those membrane-bound organelles and membrane-bound nucleus. <clears throat> and bacteria are also fairly ancient, and they are found pretty much everywhere. So they are found everywhere in the biosphere. And then the last major group, which is probably the group you're most familiar with, is going to be domain eukarya. And domain eukarya contains all organisms that have features related to the eukaryotic cell. Okay, so eukaryotic cells are much more complex. Um, they have a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. Uh, eukaryotic cells and eukaryotic organisms can either be a single cell or they can be complex multicellular organisms. And of course, again, these particular um, types of organisms have those complex membrane-bound organelles and a membrane-bound nucleus. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so let us dive into the different kingdoms of eukarya. So in this particular presentation, we're mostly going to fo fo focus on the third domain. And in, within the domain eukarya, there is four kingdoms within, within them. So the first is going to be the kingdom protist. So protist is a diverse group of eukaryotes. Many of them are single cells, uh, like euglena, like euglena, euglena, excuse me. And um, they are a type of organism that has both plant and animal-like characteristics. And then you're also going to have kingdom uh, that all plants are organized into, which is the plant kingdom. And then within this kingdom, you're going to have uh, multicellular photosynthesizers, um, such as this uh, bristlecone pine, and they are one of the oldest organisms on the planet currently. Okay. And another major king, a group uh, is going to be the kingdom of animals. Okay. And so within the kingdom of animals includes all multicellular organisms that must ingest their food or consume food. And of course, we Homo sapiens are included in this kingdom. Right. And then the last major kingdom is going to be your fungi. And fungi uh, include um, a lot of decomposers uh, and many different types of mushrooms. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, in reality, this particular organization of kingdoms may be a little outdated. And that is because um, of the development of improved techniques in analyzing the DNA of organisms. Um, and this improved technique suggests that not all protists share the same evolutionary lineage. And that means that the evolution of eukaryotes may have occurred along several different paths. So right now, a new taxonomic group called a supergroup is being developed to explain these evolutionary relationships. There are currently five supergroups for domain eukarya. However, as studies continue, the relationship and structure of these groups may further be revised. So again, this kingdom organization um, is relatively outdated and we are shifting into this idea of supergroups for the um, domain eukarya. Okay. All right, so let's continue our discussion of evolution and how we organize the life's diversity. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about how we give each organism a unique binomial name. So in biology, we like to give an organism a unique two-part scientific name. These binomial names are made up of the genus, which is the first word, and the uh, specific epithet of the species, uh, which is the second word. Okay. For example, the scientific name of the garden pea is Pisum uh, sativum, where Pisum is the genus and sativum is the specific epithet. Okay. Now, I am sure you are wondering why it is necessary for biologists to use scientific names when every organism also has common name. And to answer this question, let us look at an example of why this is necessary. Okay. 
So if you are from North America, you are probably familiar with the fact that we have one rather large uh, cat um, that is native to our continent, okay? So this wild cat here. Now, depending on where you are from in North America, you could refer to this cat as a cougar. You could refer to this cat as a mountain lion. You could refer to this cat as a puma. You can refer to this cat as a panther, or you can even refer to this cat as a catamount. And these common names here all refer to the same animal, the same species of animal, which is this particular large cat native to North America. And this variation in naming comes from the fact that people live in different regions. And so the common name for this particular animal varies from region to region, okay? So this is a prime example of why scientists need scientific names um, so that it avoids confusion for anyone that is not common to an area or could be studying the animal from a completely different country for all we know. And so this is just a universal way that we name species so it avoids confusion since science is highly collaborative and we often exchange information from different groups of people. Okay, so to avoid confusion and not get um, cross-eyed with all of these different common names, uh, the actual scientific name that was given to the species is Puma concolor. Okay, so we know as biologists that this particular animal is Puma concolor, and we won't get confused with all of these common names. Okay, so that is why we need these specific binomial scientific names.